Hey guys I'm Yurizi. This story is all about what if Naruto can time travel between the past and the present. Let it not be said that being Uzumaki Naruto is anything easy, he has an obligation to the future but a duty to the past, and a time traveling jutsu that lets him travel between both. Before we proceed with the story, please like and subscribe to this channel if you liked the video and don't forget to check the description for the other works of the author if you liked the story. Let's start. Chapter 4, Butterfly Naruto awoke to a dizzying headache, which already set him into a foul mood. That, and he had accidentally crashed in a tree instead of just renting a hotel like normal sane people. Sane people didn't include ninja though, for Naruto knew more than a few of them who had sprawled onto the local foliage on more than one occasion. Though they were practical to a degree, trees were generally, well, hard with rough bark, and didn't make for the most pleasant of beds. That, and there was no complimentary soap. But there wasn't a hotel in the world which could fully capture the beauty of waking up in the morning on the loftiest branch to the sun peeling its way into a navy sky. Just look at it made a brief moment in which Naruto forgot all his troubles, stretched out on one of the highest branches, just swaying with the wind. He had to get down eventually, though, before the bees came out of the nest above him. Minato had something about leaving to take his now more experienced team onto a higher class mission. It was quite close to the inauguration, which happened a day prior, but Minato was, well, Minato, and he was going to be needed just as much today as every other day. The world always seemed to need him. He leapt off the branch and landed on the ground far below, cracking his knees in the process with a satisfying crick. The morning was perfect for a lazy maundering around town, without people stopping to glare at him. Or maybe he was just having too much fun pretending he was incognito all the time. Still, taking a stroll without glares or crude remarks was nice, and in fact, most of the people seemed rather nice to him. And some looked at him curiously. Maybe it was just his disturbing similarity to the fourth. Speaking of the Yondai Ma, without him around, the past seemed exactly like the present. People didn't really change. Perhaps the style was a bit different 20 years in the past, but civilians were still civilians and ninja were still ninja, and therefore little about Kanaha was different. In fact, Naruto was getting a bit bored. His steps were leisurely, and he made his way around with no particular destination in mind. He ended up with a stroll completely through town, seeing little kids run by him he was sure he'd met in the future as his older peers, a just-opened bookshop dedicated solely to Jiraiya's literary works of art, and stores that he'd never seen before that had closed down before he ever got the chance to peruse them. Speaking of those so-called literary art, Naruto really had to wonder did Kakashi read them yet? If so, he was one perverted young boy, who would grow to be a super pervert old man. It was natural as Uzumaki Naruto that eventually he'd find himself seated in one of the stools at Ichiraku, even though he'd never made the decision to go there. Ah, his subconscious. Always a step ahead of him. Can I get anything for you? A young Tyuchi asked him. Naruto was disturbed to see him without wrinkles. Just a miso ramen, please. All right, coming right up. Ramen in the morning always smelled the best. Naruto smiled ruefully. Soon it wouldn't be just Tyuchi alone in the back preparing food a young, chirpy Ayam would soon join him. Naruto wondered what Tyuchi would think if he'd told him, would he be surprised? Probably not. Maybe loving to cook ramen was genetic, just like loving to eat ramen. They were such a good parent-child pair. Naruto had always wondered if he'd be as good with his father if his father had been alive. There was a time when he'd doubted it. He hadn't been particularly enamored with the thought of his father after he'd found out who he really was. There'd even been a time when Naruto had wanted so badly for his father to be the Yondai Ma, the hero of Kanaha which they learned so much about at the academy. If his father was the fourth Hokage, no one would make fun of him and certainly not push him around. But after finding out it was the Yondai Ma who'd done this to him, and in turn, that the man was his father, he'd lost most of his fascination, until it only became a distant curiosity. Jiraiya had argued the man's case to Naruto before though the blonde had never listened particularly. It's not like you to care so little, Jiraiya had frowned sternly. Though Naruto had had no words to tell him. I'm just, not interested. The at the time Chunin had shrugged. Was he blonde? W-H-A, yes. 
Yes, he was. Blue-eyed. Yes. And my mother. Kushina? Oh, she had this fiery red hair. Blue eyes too, but they were lighter more green. Huh. That's it. Jiraiya had blinked in disbelief. No reasons? No, why? Do you even care at all? Not really, no. He couldn't not when these people had given him up to the demon ready to destroy the world. And maybe he was being a bit obtuse, and maybe a bit stubborn. But honestly, when it came down to it, he didn't want to know them. To understand them. Not when the betrayal stung so much. You know, he did what he had to. Jiraiya began, anyway. There was nothing that could stop the Kyuubin no summon, no jutsu. That your father could even come up with a way to somehow stop it was a stroke of genius in itself. He was a great man, Naruto. A fantastic leader and an honorable person. He'd have wanted to know you he'd have been so proud of you. Honestly, Jiraiya. Naruto sighed. It's fine. Can we stop talking about this? Jiraiya watched him carefully with saddened eyes as if it hurt to know that his student's living legacy held his own father in so little disregard. If that's what you want. Of course, meeting the man in person changed his perspective, Naruto mused over his ramen. Though he hadn't quite thought of him as his father in anything more than vague interest in the obvious genetic inheritance he'd received, he could admit personally to himself that Jiraiya was right he wasn't a bad man. Obviously it wasn't intentional to make the first ten years of Naruto's life a brutal uphill struggle. Maybe he'd even felt some ounce of regret, sealing that monster into his own kid. The most ironic part was, Minato even seemed to like him. Perhaps the one person in the entire world who held Minato in a flat, impassive regard was the one person that Minato seemed the most charitable to. He'd insisted on Naruto coming to dinner with them, and joining them around the stalls. And while the younger blonde certainly hadn't protested, Naruto wouldn't quite call it an outing he was enthused over. He loved Team 7 though, that was for sure. Everything about Obito had him amused. Everything about Rin had him smiling. Even Kakashi, who generally made an ass out of himself and tried to keep to himself had Naruto attempting to draw him out. Perhaps Jiraiya was wrong. Maybe anchoring to this time hadn't been such a bad idea after all. It was certainly a learning experience. And wasn't what the old man always preached about. Thanks for the food. Naruto smiled to Tiochi as he paid for his ramen. The man waved as he left. He wandered aimlessly around the streets, unsure of what to do in which he had so little problems. There were no personal issues to resolve, to Sasuke looming in the forever distant horizon, no Sakura to watch him with those heartbreaking eyes. And perhaps that wasn't a bad thing. He certainly didn't want to go back yet. His time felt like a far-off dream, some sort of scattered memory he could hazily recall, but mostly didn't want to. He didn't want to admit it, but maybe he liked it better here in the past. He couldn't remember the last time he had been so jovial so carefree. And then, of course, there was Namikaze Minato, one of the key points in his life to his existence that didn't even know he was one yet. What the Omi got? Eek. Get out of here you pervert. Naruto looked up. With a smack that could have rattled the surface of the planet, Jiraiya went flying out of the bushes, only to roll lifelessly onto the pavement. A couple people around stopped to gasp and point scandalously. The old pervert himself didn't seem to have changed much. He was still, well, old, with a mane of grey hair, and obviously a lecherous streak a mile wide. The sun in jumped to his feet as if he was quite used to this treatment and barreled right past him, as did the angered women who followed soon after. Naruto smiled. Some things never changed. The street the bathhouse was located on exited out to the western gate, the large walls looking as if they hadn't aged at all. Naruto wondered if there was even anything powerful enough to take them down. Orochimaru's snakes at the Chunin exams had only crumbled a bit of them but the whole thing? Was there a jutsu that existed that could do that? Maybe but Naruto had no intentions of facing it down. Tuchinin were lounging near the edges of the large opening, and Naruto didn't envy them standing in the midday sweltering heat on guard duty. He'd missed that with his automatic promotion, luckily. He was halfway to the other side when another Chunin flew out of the forest, looking completely out of breath. There's trouble on the western border. 
The man gasped, bending onto his knees. The three on guard duty stood to attention. What? Were you on patrol? Which squadron? Red Squad. The man panted. And yeah, we were. It's the team dispatched earlier this morning with Hokage-sama. At this, the air seemed to still as the assembled group quickly realized how serious the situation may be. They were near the Iwa border, around the valley of the end it was an ambush. My team's out helping them, but they need reinforcements. Aye aye, he took a shuddering breath, I came as fast as I could but I. We'll send a team out immediately. Kota, contact HQ and get an Umbu squad over there ASAP. Naruto blinked. Iwa? Hokage? He didn't bother to hear the rest of the conversation he dropped his leftovers from Ichiraku, patted himself down to make sure he was fully equipped, took two steps and then flew into the trees before the Chunin could even notice. He was well acquainted with the long and grueling path to the Valley of the End, and, just like when he'd made it all those years ago, it was still nerve-wracking and filled with anxious impatience. Naruto wasn't sure why each step felt like it was ten years too slow, why it even really mattered to him, especially when he'd just been musing as to how little he cared for his father, and yet here he was, bolting out into the middle of the forest after him. There wasn't even a logical reason to be worried. Minato wasn't considered one of the strongest shinobi in the world for no reason, and he already had a reputation for scaring the shit out of the Iwanin with his name only. And while certainly Kakashi wasn't the 1000 Kapinin, he wasn't useless. And Rin and Obito? Well they definitely didn't suck, that was for sure. And yet, even so, ever since he had chased down Sasuke, he hadn't held this much fear in his heart as he did now. Rin whipped her head around. S Sensei. Watch out. The kunao missed its mark, and Rin breathed a sigh of relief. She shouldn't have been so tense, it was Minato Sensei after all, but they'd been fighting for a long time now, and if exhaustion was getting to her, who ran at a normal human speed, she couldn't imagine how it felt to him, who ran at a rate ten times as fast. She dispatched her enemy with a swift blow to the back of the head, trying to listen to the sounds of Kakashi and Obito fighting a distance away over the sound of her fiercely beating heart. When had that guy left for reinforcements? Like, an hour ago? Rin was cursing that idiot's slowness, and for that matter, his useless team who hadn't done much aside from divert the enemy's attention. She didn't know where they were though she suspected their whereabouts were somewhere on the ground. I'm fine, Rin Chan. Minato gave an exhausted little smile, before sending a flurry of kunao whipping past her and into the enemy lines, so fast she couldn't even make them out as they slid past her. It had been an ambush. Apparently, the Iwanin had already got wind of Sensei's inauguration. Minato wouldn't be starting office until a few more weeks because the Sandaime still had much to do before he retired, but it had already been stated that when he did step down, Minato would take his place. How'd they know so fast, Sensei? She panted under her breath. I don't know. He sighed to her. But it really wasn't much of a secret. Back in the war, there had been flea on site orders at the very name of Namikaze Minato. When they'd gotten such a backbone, Rin didn't know, but they certainly weren't keeping to those orders. Team 7 had been on what was supposed to be a regular C class retrieval mission, only to find the Kanaha Umbu they were supposed to get the scroll off of murdered, with a small legion of Iwanin in their wake. Looping two three pronged kunao in his fingers, Minato flicked them into the crowd. Without another look at his student, his Hiroshin was tearing up their numbers. Rin watched in astonishment. She could never get over the awe she had at her sensei's speed just like the rumors, she could only catch a faint blur of yellow before it was gone completely, leaving nothing but butchered bodies in its wake. The numbers were dropping steadily but not at a pace that they could keep for long. The four were holding out for reinforcements, there was no other alternative, aside from taking their chances at fleeing. How were they supposed to win this? She thought worriedly. Even with Sensei, who was crushing through their numbers, the odds still seemed slim. Minato finally skidded to a halt, breathing labored. The Iwanin were regrouping, and a slight standstill gave both sides a chance to recover strength. It was then she saw it. From the opposite side of the field, one of the bodies on the ground had begun to stir. There was a glimmer of metal, and then... Sensei! She screamed, but it was too late. He hadn't aimed for the head, 
which would have caught Minato's attention quicker when at his eye level, but at the leg. The blow wasn't critical, but it was enough to cripple the use of Hiroshin. Minato recoiled in shock as he realized he'd been hit, sending Shuriken to the nin that had hit him. The man was dead, but he had gotten the winning hit. Sensei. Rin gasped, fear welling in her stomach. He pulled the kunao out of his leg with a wince, dispatching Kage Bunshin to stall the enemies. Rin rushed to her sensei, quickly trying to heal the wound. It had cut deep, cutting a few tendons and horrendously close to the bone. As Rin worked furiously with the chakra she had left, tears brimming her eyes, she realized she wouldn't be able to heal it enough. It'd take at least a day or so until Minato could walk upright, let alone fight an outnumbered battle and use Hiroshin. How does it look Rin? He asked hoarsely, watching the battle and throwing Kunao when it seemed appropriate. She shook her head. I can close it, but you won't be able to move it a lot. Her sensei hissed under his breath, in what may have been a curse. Her other two teammates looked up from their battle. Sensei. Called Obito worriedly, in the midst of a cat on Jutsu. Look out idiot. Rin screamed at him. He quickly turned back to his battle, catching one of the shinobi which had dodged his fireball at an awkward angle with his blade. Kakashi scowled at him, as he struck for his teammate and dispatched the enemy. The three others dropped from their trees and the ten or so Kakashi was fighting came closer. Thirteen on two, the odds didn't look very good. Rin turned her attention back to her own fight, where her sensei had sent a doton into the fray. Rin. Minato gasped, hitching himself onto one leg, and attempting to get a feel for the other. Get out of here. You, Obito, and Kakashi. Rin blinked at him, eyes wide. Why you're serious? She studied his expression, before exploding, no way. I won't leave. I'm I'm not going to leave you here knowing you won't make it back. The fourth Hokage gave her an exasperated, but morbid look. Rin. I'm not leaving. She insisted. And I know that Obito and Kakashi would never, ever abandon you in battle either. This has nothing to do with deserting your comrades. Minato breathed heavily. This is for your safety I should T have brought you guys out here, it was too soon. This isn't your fault. Said Rin, shock furrowing her brows. How could you think this is your fault? Sensei we're not going to leave you here. We'll fight it out and, and figure something out. Rin. I'm not leaving. She interrupted, shouting. The fourth frowned, but his student was dead set. However, the battle in front of them wasn't going very well. Minato was already low on reserves he'd overused the Hiroshin, but it wasn't nearly enough. Obito and Kakashi had managed between the two of them, their teamwork keeping them above the water. Rin was here with him, already weakened from healing them so many times and from using her own jutsu. In short, they were all going to die. Oddly, he found his thoughts moving to Naruto. That half-smile he gave when his eyes were distant, like he was looking somewhere far away where Minato couldn't follow. The ocean color of his eyes, so much like his own. The way he appraised Minato as a person, not as some sort of legendary demigod, some sort of hero. Minato squeezed his eyes shut. He shouldn't be thinking about this now. Why was he giving up? Why did he think of Naruto in these last few moments a boy he'd barely met and yet there was such a strong pull that he felt with him? He wasn't thinking of Rin, Obito, or Kakashi. Wasn't thinking of Jiraiya, who had just returned to see him and congratulate him. Didn't think of the Sandaima, who'd have to work so many more years because he'd be dead. Not of Kushina, who would be crying over his grave until the day she died. He thought of Naruto. Now they were losing a battle against what seemed to be hundreds, whether an exaggeration or not. He'd never see him again. Don't even fucking think about it. Minato's eyes pried themselves open into a sea of fire. Rin stopped shivering in the midst of a sea of enemy ninja, eyes opening to see a world drenched in crimson. She didn't think she'd ever seen so much fire in her life. The entire sky seemed to have churned into hell itself, and when she looked up there were no clouds, no sun just burning fire. It wasn't the sky on fire. It was the world. 
An enormous pillar of searing hot flames erupted from the middle of the lines of burning ninja, swaying in the wind and flickering in the sky until everything seemed like it was burning, and there was a man in the middle of it with a shocking head of blonde hair, and for a moment she thought, Minato? But Minato had never seen so inhuman, had never stood so silently amidst a world full of flames, had never watched her with monstrous red eyes, never had a face like... like Naruto. She blinked, eyes squinted from the intense light, attempting to make out the figure again. But that enormous pillar tail, maybe, of fire swung her way again, and blocked her vision of the center of the field. Rin. Minato called, limping with one leg and arm over his eyes. What's going on? Can you see anything? I. She trailed off, attempting to see once more. I thought I thought I saw. It doesn't matter now. Her sensei shouted. Get back. Hurry. She stumbled away, grabbing the Yandaime before he could injure himself further attempting to walk, and making for a safer distance, away from the flames which seemed to eat everything with rapture. They made it to the tree line and she was already sweating from the morbid, ungodly heat. She couldn't stop trembling, looking into the sky where fire took to the air like some sort of enormous wing. The heat was unbearable and she was exhausted and her eyes stung from trying to stare into the fire for too long, and Minato was next to her looking lifeless, sprawled in front of the tree with lidded eyes, breathing heavily and she didn't even know where Obito and Kakashi were, but she could only hope they'd made it out of there in time before everything had exploded into fire and then... It was gone. The fire seemed to crumble out of existence as wind rattled past her, stealing her breath and gathering it to the center where a maelstrom took the place of what was once an ocean of flames, the fire burned out with the wind that took its place. And then, nothing. She collapsed into darkness. Minato had not, though. He had a clear shot of the destruction, trees splintering with the wind, the flames snuffed out as his breath was stolen, saw the wind tighten into a man's palm, a perfect azure sphere, spinning with the power of a hurricane, whipping the charred landscape with a stinging wind that lapped at the edges of the field. Was that? It couldn't be. Not the Rosengan. All he'd have were memories to study, because it was gone before he could fully inspect it. But he could never mistake his original technique. There wasn't any other kind like it in the world. So then, what was that? The burned foliage had been shredded as if stretched by a tornado, the grass uprooted into scars of dirt and the roasted bodies smoldered. But Minato wasn't remotely bothered by all of this. What disturbed him was the shock of lemon-colored hair he could see from here, on a man that seemed to have a perturbing like. Naruto. He called out into the scorched earth, and he could have sworn that back had stiffened. Naruto. Minato blinked. He couldn't tell from his place pushed back by the wind, squinting through it to see that Naruto's eyes were bloodshot red. Or that his hands were claws. All he knew was that Naruto Naruto who said he was nothing more than a barely passing Jounin who had come back from a tiring reconnaissance mission, who smiled with him and his team, who he cared for had just used his ultimate technique. One he made up, and one that no one else in the entire world would ever know about. And he had used it better than he could have. Suddenly, from his distance Minato could see Naruto's eyes flutter closed, as he dropped onto the ground in one swift motion. Naruto. Despite his injuries, Minato ran to the boy, who was breathing heavy, collapsed on him amidst the destruction he had created. Naruto. He said softer as he approached the boy. Naruto, are you okay? The boy made a move to stand, but Minato quickly made a move to press him back down, despite his wince at his own injuries. Ugh. Stupid seal, wasting my chakra. It sounded like a bunch of gibberish, so Minato brushed it off. Naruto, we're going to take you back to the hospital okay? Naruto. The boy had stopped mumbling, slipping into the unconsciousness that could only be chakra exhaustion. Minato sensei. Obito called as he ran up into the clearing, looking frightened by the carnage. He gave a furtive, worried, and perhaps even frightened, look to Naruto. What happened? Kakashi jugged up behind him, and Minato was relieved to see them both okay. He coughed, attempting to keep himself conscious for a little while longer. Naruto he. Sensei. Kakashi's voice was cold as he spoke, but his eyes spoke volumes. That fire, and that move. He looked alarmed. What was that? Minato shook his head. 
Don't know. To be honest, Obito began, looking just as bothered as Kakashi. I thought it sort of looked like, the Rasengan. Rasengan? Kakashi echoed. He looked at Minato. Sensei, isn't that your technique? Yeah. The fourth breathed. Obito was watching Naruto with a discomforted expression, as if he wasn't sure what to make of him. Uchiha's were born into fire the Gukakua was a testimony to an Uchiha's strength. But that had been like standing in an inferno, some sort of inhuman sun scorching in front of him. His face still felt hot, even as that wind had snuffed all the fire out. The Yondaime couldn't blame him. It was mind-blowing, even to Minato. Let's get back. He said eventually, picking up Naruto's limp form. We've got to get to a hospital. His team couldn't help but agree. The only thing establishing dreams from reality was the steady, slow beeping of Naruto's monitor some feet away from him. Minato didn't remember how long he'd been there, and usually the noise would have agitated him. But he welcomed it now. It meant that Naruto was still alive. It was strange though, to see his face unmarred in false sleep, the dark lashes and the curve of his nose which seemed so familiar. It looked quite a bit like Minato's, but his was more straight in the middle while Naruto's had a more feminine curve. Probably his mother's nose. Why Minato was musing on Naruto's genetic features was beyond him, but probably had something to do with the fact they were so similar to his own. But to be honest, Minato was almost relieved Naruto wasn't awake. What would he say if he was? It had been four days or so, and Minato hadn't exactly been confined to bed rest, but he certainly wasn't allowed to leave. Which was fine by him, because all he did for the past three days was sit in Naruto's hospital room, hearing the monotonous machine and watching the pale form that still didn't have the flush of color from health. Minato could. The voice of the third Hokage startled him, as he sat upright in the chair he had been slouching in. Sandai Mesama. Minato blinked in surprise. Why you're here? You gave me quite the scare when I heard you had been injured I can't imagine another twenty years with all that paperwork. Sandai Mes smiled. How are you? Minato shook his head. I'm fine just, have you heard anything from the doctors? It's just chakra exhaustion. The Sandai Mes informed patiently. Except that Naruto-san has extremely enormous chakra reserves about four times that of normal shinobi. For the past couple days before this incident, he was working on low reserves. Low reserves? Naruto had seemed fine. Why is that, Hokage-sama? The Sandaime chucked at the Hokage part, but continued nonetheless. I don't know exactly, but whatever he had done was extremely hard on his reserves, and was something that most humans could not attempt. His eyes traveled to the sleeping boy. The doctors say he will wake up soon, and I must say I'm grateful. There's much to be learned from him. Minato blinked. Like what? The smile that the Hokage gave him was a very odd one. Minato-kun, have you ever thought of children? To say the Yondaime was startled would be an understatement. What? The Hokage as of present shook his head. Ah, never mind. He strode closer to Naruto, until he was right next to his bed, standing above him. There are many things we need to discuss with him. The Sandaime said eventually, his voice carrying an odd tone. There are things that we will only find out from he himself, and nothing with tests and medicine will do much for our questions. The fourth to be didn't know much about what the Sandaime was saying, but he nodded anyways. Carefully, Sarutobi pushed back the covers. Minato got up too, more or less to see what exactly the third Hokage was doing. Naruto had bandages running up his right arm, even then there were times when the burns could be seen, sweltering red against his tanned skin. The boy looked so much younger as he lay still on the sheets, nothing more than breath rattling in him that kept him looking alive. The third pushed up Naruto's hospital shirt very slowly, as to not wake the boy. There. Minato leaned in closer, eyes widening at what he saw. It pulsed in time to the boy's heartbeat, the black kanji fading into his skin before returning with much vigor, almost as if it lifted above the boy's skin and into translucent tendrils above him. It was magnificent, like looking at a work of art that was so rare that it awed everyone that had ever seen it. This seal could be considered a work of art, Minato had never seen anything like it. Ever. 
Jiraiya would be impressed if he saw the intricacy of such a seal. What is it? He whispered. The Sandaima shook his head. I haven't the slightest idea. Minato leaned closer, watching the seal pulse, fade, and then pulse again. Soon, his hand was nearing the seal, the swirl in the middle that seemed so oddly familiar. He was close, about to touch it when. Don't touch it. The voice was deep and low, almost a growl. Minato retracted his hand immediately, standing upright and staring down with surprise into Naruto's face. There was something burning fear, in his eyes, which weren't the blue they normally were, but a deep Prussian with pupils that looked like pinpricks. Chapter 5, Shindokaku All right. Minato backed away hastily, hands up in what he assumed to be the universal surrender. I won't. The way Naruto was watching him with unreadable, impassive eyes made rethink his assumption. The Sandaime retained his pensive expression as Minato gazed guiltily at the now awake blonde, seeming to take this all in thought and turn it slowly in his head. Perhaps analyzing the blonde who knew. The Sandaime had the veritable reputation of being quite the astute psychoanalyst, a trait he used derisively during his career. Again, that slight tug to the bottom of his gut sharpened as he thought about the Sandaime about his illustrious long-winded career as a ninja that, still, lingered in the aftertaste of each Fire Nation breath, long after he'd stopped being just a ninja. Minato was aware that the Sandaime had high hopes for him, and thought him more than qualified for the job. But Minato wasn't so sure himself. After all, all he saw on the bed was a slightly frightened, defensive teenager, though surely the Sandaime saw something else. Minato. Sarutobi began slowly. The blonde broke out of his thoughts. Hokage-sama. Would you mind excusing us for a moment? Hiruzen began with a slight quirking to his lips. I believe our young friend may have some important information for me though I don't think he'd be comfortable sharing it with you. The brief flare of jealousy that erupted with the words was quickly crushed by Minato. It shouldn't be any of his concern if Sarutobi had something personal with this boy after all, who was he to say anything about it? They'd only met recently, he surely wasn't anyone of importance in Naruto's life. Of course. He answered easily enough, swallowing through the lump in his throat. Though his joints felt stiff as he exited the room, closing the door behind him, closed his eyes and let out a deep breath, as if finally releasing all the pressure and tension that seemed to hover heavily over the room. Then his eyes snapped open. Two pairs of guilt-ridden eyes stared up at him from his two students on their hands and knees, pressed against the door. You too. Minato sighed, exasperated. Obito leapt to his feet with a sheepish grin, rubbing the back of his head as Rin shamefully crawled off the floor. We were just wondering if Naruto was okay. The girl began hastily. We knew he had woken up but then the Sandaime. Why is the Sandaime in Naruto's room? Obito interrupted excitedly. What's going on? Anything cool. Minato wished he knew himself. No, he waved him off. Not that I know of. Oh. Obito drooped, though he still looked mildly curious. So why is the Sandaime in there? Good question. Minato quipped, wondering the same himself. Not for the first time, he was a little annoyed at getting left out of the loop. I guess he wanted to ask Naruto some questions. Rin snapped up with wide eyes. Is Naruto getting in trouble? She asked, frightened. I'm not sure. Minato admitted. Well, he didn't think so. Why would the Sandaime get mad at Naruto? Obito rolled his eyes, scoffing. Naruto was so badass. I'm sure it's nothing. And then, with excitement. Maybe he's getting a medal. Minato shook his head, smile dry of all emotion. Who knows? Why don't we head to the cafeteria though? I could use some food. Of course, sensei. Rin piped up, grabbing him by the hand and physically dragging him down the hall. Obito caught up quick enough, already in better spirits at the thought of food. So, the Sandaime began, amiably enough. Do you mind if I sit down, Naruto-kun? Naruto's eyes never once strayed from the elder shinobi, never once blinked. His heart seemed caught in a cage three sizes too small, attempting to struggle its way out with rapid movement. Uh, no sure, go ahead. Hiruzen nodded, 
pulling a chair next to the bed. Now, Naruto-kun you don't mind if I call you that, do you? It's fine. Naruto answered quickly. Ah well alright then, Naruto-kun. The man crossed his legs, pulling out his pipe from one of the assorted pockets dotting the inside of his robe, a small flame flickering to life at his fingers a technique he'd passed down to Naruto at some point. I figured we may as well get comfortable with each other I've been told we were very close at some point. There was a moment in which Naruto said nothing at all, blinking the first time since he'd woken up. Then his eyes widened. I'm sorry. His mouth attempted to make more words, but nothing came out. Instead, he sat up higher on the pillows, and tried to swallow all the confusion in his throat. Air what I mean is, how did you? Let me tell you a story, Naruto. Hiruzen smiled graciously. Would you like to hear it? The blonde rigorously nodded. I met a boy just like you, once. The Sandaime began, after a great heave of his pipe. The thick vanilla smell wafted into the room. He had blonde hair, perhaps a bit wilder, and three scars on his cheeks. He'd just began the end to something very tragic, I'd think. He had an expression to his face that I couldn't quite decipher quite a feat for me you must understand. There are very few people I can't read clearly. Naruto only nodded numbly, listening with rapture. At any rate, he explained to me that I would be seeing a lot of him. He asked for my forgiveness though for what, I'm still not sure. Though I insisted he at least stay for tea, as he'd been in the rain this whole time, he declined. He continued to assure me that we'd be seeing a lot of one another, and that we would have quite a lot of tea. He sounded so sure of himself. The Sandaime ashed his pipe, still not looking at the blonde on the bed. That was twenty years ago. Naruto's eyes widened. Just after the end of the first shinobi war. He didn't make much sense to me at the time, this grim man in the rain. I thought him just another ninja, lost after a tumultuous war. Imagine my surprise when I met him a few years later, in a watermelon patch with my newly appointed genin team. But he was different, you see. He was unsure and confused just as confused as I was. There was no recognition in his eyes, this was a man who had never met me. How strange then, that I remembered his face and his scars from a lifetime ago. And now, in a hospital bed, after apparently saving four of my shinobi. Naruto only looked down, unsure of what to say of even where to begin. Now, I don't require any answers from you, Naruto. Ended the Sandaime magnanimously. I'm aware that your doings are your own. I've come to some of my own conclusions and quite honestly, I know enough not to question you. And then, with a smirk, after all, it's never a good idea to mess with time. Naruto looked down guiltily, rubbing at his arm. Yeah. I guess I really fucked things up, huh? Sarutobi shook his head. No you're embarking on a journey entirely of your own. I've seen the ending, and the beginning too, I suppose. But the middle is up to you. And you'll let me go. Naruto blinked in surprise. Just like that. What will happen, will happen. Advised the old man tenderly. Who am I to get in the way of that? Though it made quite a bit of sense, Naruto could imagine Jiraiya having quite a few different words to say to that. He didn't truly believe the words himself. What did this mean? Sarutobi had just imparted some of a future that had never happened to him yet at least, part of his future. To the Sandaime, it was all in the past. How very confusing. Is there anything I should tell our young friend out there? Sandaime changed conversation quickly, the last of his pipe smoking in the air. Naruto snapped back to the man. Friend. And then, oh, you mean Minato. The man would probably have quite a few questions. To be careful. Naruto decided upon finally. And, and to believe in himself, and follow his dreams. Naruto blinked away the burn in his eyes, wondering where in himself this was drudging up from. Perhaps some part of him he'd buried deep beneath his mind, where it could be treasured and forgotten. This unconditional love he used to hold for the dream he used to have. For the father he had imagined for himself. Sound advice. Perhaps he could use some of your confidence, Naruto. For such an able man, he has very little for himself. The Sandaime noted. 
And though I'm sure you already know Naruto-kun, my office is open for all those who need it. I I know. Naruto smiled, wondering how it was possible for one to man to change so little. That was the thing with old men they didn't change. Just as the Sandaime turned to leave, fear bubbled into his mouth. What if? Naruto's soft voice halted the Sandaime in his tracks. What if I'm messing everything up? Naruto wondered aloud, brokenly, the majority of his deepest fears so forthcoming in the face of his wise teacher and beloved Hokage, lost so long ago. What if the future I make is wrong? If it's a terrible ending that I don't want? You can't change destiny, Naruto could. Sarutobi counseled, before pausing. Though, I suppose, if anyone could, it would be you. The moment the Sandaime opened the door, he was met with three sheepish faces right on the other side. The old man blinked at their stupidly smiling faces, Team 7 quite obviously aware they'd been caught trying to listen in. Good thing that the Sandaime had made sure to use a silencing jutsu beforehand, for Minato's acute ears would have surely heard everything. Everyone's okay then. Sarutobi smiled. Obito and Rin nodded, blushing. The old man turned to Minato. And you as well. I've been fine for a while. Minato said honestly, rubbing at his hair. They're just keeping me here for precaution, I guess. Well it's good to see you well, my friend. And then, turning to his young teammates. And how good it is to see you too as well. I take it neither of you were injured. No sir. Rin and Obito answered in perfect unison, looking too cowed by the Sandaime's immediate presence for their usual bravado. With that, the old Hokage walked off, only giving a meaningful look to his successor as he passed. Minato wondered what wisdom the man was trying to impart on him, before shaking it off and heading towards Naruto. What did he talk to you about? Minato asked quietly. Your mission. Naruto paused. Yeah, something like that. He answered vaguely. He just, gave me a lot to think about. Minato hummed in agreement. He does that a lot, doesn't he? And, to Naruto's questioning look, seem like he knows everything, I mean. He does. Naruto agreed. People really look up to him around here. Minato sighed wistfully, wondering how long it would be for them to do the same to him. Not that he didn't have the village's adoration, no, they seemed to like him quite a bit. But he didn't quite feel like he'd earned the respect quite yet. Not of many of the veteran shinobi, anyway. Many of them thought him a young upstart who had connived the elderly Hokage into the position. They'll do the same to you. Naruto told him, for once quite honestly. You'll be a village hero too. Minato frowned. How can you be so sure of that? And the other blonde only gave him that confusing, capricious smile. Intuition, I suppose. Naruto. Obito barreled head first into the room, noodles hanging limply from his mouth and ramen broth spilling onto Rin, who squawked at the scalding water. The two traipsed in, assortment of food and all, leaping onto stools and making themselves comfortable. Minato only watched fondly as his team proceeded to bombard the blonde with an uncomfortable amount of questions. It was strange, the blonde thought idly, watching Minato snap his fingers in Obito's face. The Uchiha perked up such emotion to his pale face, so unlike Sasuke's impassive features quickly and turned to his sensei, who was smiling with amusement. Rin was handing him chocolate mochi, keeping all the strawberry for herself and leaving all the green tea ones untouched. Naruto was equally thankful for them, even though he'd charged mouth first into the extra bowl Obito had brought along with him. Thankful that she'd even think to bring him any. To include him. Obito somehow managed to wrangle Team 7, plus Naruto and minus Kakashi, who was stuck in the hospital with what seemed to be a terrible bout of infection, into the ramen stand, crowding the small stall with the four of them, but making Tyuchi into one happy man. Serves him right. The bottomless pit was saying around his noodles, the fourth bowl of the day, apparently. I always tell him to spray some disinfectant but he thinks he's too cool for that kind of stuff. That stupid kid. Obito snorted, referring to said sick teammate. You're a stupid kid too. Rin pointed out with spite. And don't be so mean to Kakashi. You know, Nurse Ranma told me that he was hallucinating. Isn't that crazy? Poor Kakashi. 
But Obito only choked on his laughter. Oh god. That's priceless what about? Any, Rinchan, let's visit him tomorrow okay? And bring your camera. No. Shrieked Rin, shocked. Minato was seated next to Naruto, looking down at his broth. But Naruto could make out his sour expression like he was fighting off his smile. He couldn't keep his mind off of what the Sandaime had said. He hadn't given Naruto more to think about, he blew his mind. Did that mean he'd time travel even more in the future? Was this some sort of ominous prophecy of things to come? He couldn't even wrap his mind around it. He'd heard about the future from someone who'd lived it in the past. Did that make sense? Could it make sense? You okay there, Naruto? The blonde blinked, mirrored Windsor blue eyes staring back at him with concern. You look a bit pale. Minato added as an afterthought. Though it was a little hard to tell with the tan the other blonde was sporting. This close though, the Yandaime could make out the almost grayish shade of blue to the other's eyes, the speckle of Prussian around the iris and the spray of almost freckles lined around his lashes. I'm fine. Naruto waved him off hastily, taking a long gulp of the leftover broth in his bowl. Well he was certainly eating healthily, that was for sure. The blonde Jounin from the future wiped at his mouth with his sleeve, thoughts suddenly twisting to the Hokage in front of him. Who'd have thought that the infamous Yandaime, one of the most renowned Hokage in recent history could be so insecure? To think, that the fearless man of history was scared of the opinions of a handful of civilians. Albeit, Kanaha may be a bit more than a handful, but the man faced down the nine-tailed demon fox. Surely he hadn't been scared then, right? Naruto's eyes lingered on the other blonde, who had turned to grab Obito under his arm for a vicious nuji, Rin's howl of laughter muted by his own thoughts. Surely, at the very end, he hadn't regretted it. Naruto had always assumed that Minato had just sort of, thought that he was doing what was best for his people, had just kind of thought that the village would think of the blonde as some sort of hero, and that life would carry on happily. But a small part of him thought back to the Minato against the dim underwash of hospital greys, sunlight nebulized by the distance in his eyes vulnerable. By the time he'd surfaced from the murky waters of his musings, Obito was subdued, hair wilder than it had been before, and Rin had regained her breath to lightly pick at her salad once more. Minato was watching the two of them again, with that fond expression he'd had in the hospital. You're doing a good job. Naruto found himself saying, wondering why he thought Minato even wanted to hear this. The young Daime turned to him, confused. Huh. With them. He nudged to the man's two Genin students. And with Kanaha. For a moment, the older blonde said nothing at all, only wearing a look of vague incomprehension, before a shy, hesitant smile took to his face. You think so? He asked quietly. Naruto felt his gut twist in guilt at the hopefulness in Minato's voice. He'd hated this man for the longest time. Condemned him in his mind for the deepest pit in hell. Yes. He answered, regardless. Iwa is already angry. Minato pointed out, face turning grim. He looked away. Angry enough to attempt an assassination, even when they hardly have the strength to rebuild. Kanaha has bigger problems to worry about than Iwagakur. Naruto waved him off. And they'll cool off, after some negotiations. Most of them, anyway. Naruto knew that even 20 years in the future, Kakashi's name would hold the highest sum in the Iwagakur bingo book. You're really knowledgeable about all these politics and stuff. Rin noted shyly, peering over from being Minato's shoulder. Naruto smiled at her. I was there for a few years, remember? And then, with a laugh. I probably already sound more like a diplomat than a shinobi. But you kick ass on the battlefield. Obito crowed. Naruto only attempted to laugh it off. What was that technique, anyway? Rin asked, curiously. The one that kind of looked like senseis. At the mention of the Rasengan-like technique they'd seen that day, Minato's curiosity was piqued as well. Uh. Naruto swallowed. Well uh, it's just something I made up. I have a wind affinity, you see, so it's sort of made to work like a vacuum and... And the other one, Dash. Obito broke in, and Naruto almost cried in relief at Obito's unbridled excitement for once coming in handy. 
The big fire thingy. That's a blood limit. Naruto cut in quickly. Never seen a blood limit like that. There are a lot of them you haven't seen. Minato shushed the Uchiha swiftly, rolling his eyes. Kanaha's not the only place that has them, you know. And think of how many we have, just in the village. Rin hummed. Well there's the Inuzuka, the Akimichi, the Yamanaka, the Nara, the Hyuga, and the Uchiha, of course. Minato nodded sternly. Trust the blonde to turn this into some sort of teacher-student lecture. That's right. There's lots of them all over the world. That's gotta be millions, then. Not that many. The young Daima chuckled. They're still fairly uncommon. But there are quite a few. And then, to Naruto. Where does yours originate from? Put on the spot, Naruto could only open his mouth, half words, and thoughts tumbling out of his mouth. Well uh, I get it from my mother. She, er, well I don't know much about her, but she came from Uzushiagakur, I think, but I. Uzushiagakur. Rin gasped, excitedly. Wow. You know, that place doesn't exist anymore. While simultaneously, Minato's brows pulled together. Uzushiagakur. As Obito jumped up, wicked. Overwhelmed, Naruto only blinked at them all. And then, finally. I didn't know it was such a big deal. He croaked out. Big deal. Rin echoed incredulously. You're from Uzushiagakur? Not really. Naruto protested hastily. My mom's from there, er well I think she's half from there, anyway, I don't really know. Are you a Fuinjutsu master? Obito was already halfway in his face. I hear they're all super cool ceiling masters. Well yes, but... No way, dash. Rin had jumped up too, the both of them already so close even as Minato attempted to pry them away. Well then you're absolutely from Uzushiagakur. Have you ever been there? What was it like? Gosh, we learned all about it at the academy and I've always wanted to go. Whoa, whoa. Finally, Minato managed to pry them both away from him, leaving Naruto to breath heavily feeling like he'd been mauled by rabid attack dogs. Let's not kill him with questions, huh? Hey, hey. Rin turned to Minato. Isn't Kushin a san from Uzushiagakur? Minato blinked. She is. Minato affirmed with a light smile. Naruto remembered to feign ignorance. Kushin a san. He repeated, keeping a touch of confusion in his tone. Sensei's girlfriend. Rin crooned. Minato, for his part, was blushing. Though he most definitely was pleased. Naruto turned to him. Is that true? Well, yeah. Well I'm sure she's really nice. Naruto commented neutrally, unsure of what else to say. It wasn't like he could just say, yeah I already knew that. She's my mom, you know. Oh, and speaking of which, you're my dad. You should meet her. Minato said before he could stop himself. At Naruto's surprised face, he realized his words. There were very few people that were of Minato's relationship with Kushina. And out of that handful, only Jiraiya was aware of how serious they were. His team was aware of her, yes. Met her a few times, even. But most certainly weren't aware of her status as the Kyuubijin Hiroki, let alone the fact that Minato found himself contemplating the thought of marrying her. He'd never put himself or her so foolishly in danger by making them official, or by telling anyone, let alone a stranger he'd met a few days ago. Like Naruto. Yeah, sure. The other blonde agreed amiably. Yet Minato hadn't even hesitated. But why? It wasn't that he didn't trust the blonde, because oddly, the other Jounin had managed to worm his way through most of Minato's defenses. But they had only met a few days prior. There was something about Naruto. But what was it? Chapter 6, Crawl When he and Jiraiya had begun their trek out of Kanaha, he hadn't expected Sakura to come to say goodbye. Jiraiya had gone ahead of him, and Sakura had asked him to stay back. She had silently grabbed his hand as he turned to walk through the gates, and, just as silently, he met Jiraiya's eyes. He wasn't sure what message was conveyed in the man's burning gaze, but it almost seemed more than he understood. 
Nonetheless, the sun in nodded, turning away and heading off alone. The sun was just starting its ascension into heaven, the day was new and soft, like a bursting peach of color. The sun a dim, benign presence at the edge of the horizon, Sakura would remember the way Naruto's hair was bright and tousled, bleeding gold at the edges in the early light that painted the ground in long strokes. The way he was almost unidentifiable in this bleeding saffron painting she'd never seen before, with this indomitable protagonist standing like a tragic prelude in the foreground, windy hair, and cloudy eyes. Little did she know that Naruto was appraising the same of her. Half of her was painted in that same burning light, the other marred by long, narrow shadows tagging at her clothing and the edge of her nose. The determined seaweed green of her eyes, calloused hands, and arms lined with medical seals painted to her elbows. They'd both become heroes in two separate stories. Don't look at me like that. He began jokingly, unsure of what else to say. For a moment, he remembered with absurd clarity that it was Sakura who was the last to see Sasuke in Kanaha. That it was Sakura who had plead him to stay. That it was Sakura now, watching him like they were coming up to some sort of crossroad he hadn't been aware was there. Like what? She tilted her head, smile creasing her cheeks. Like you're about to do something stupid. He pulled a face. Her smile widened. You are. She nudged him playfully. I don't do stupid things like that anymore. He denied. And then added, unhelpfully, but if the monument ends up neon colored, don't be too surprised. She rolled her eyes. I'll blame Kano Amaru. For that, yes. Naruto nodded. And when it glows in the dark then you can blame me. You didn't actually do that. She gave him an incredulous look. Before, did you? Of course not. Naruto scoffed though really, it was up to debate. I'm not twelve anymore, Sakura-chan. Sure don't act like it. She teased, smirking. Her smile fell, then. Naruto wished he could have kept it there, if not for a bit longer. It'd been a long time since he'd seen her smile so wide like all their concerns mattered so little. Naruto I. He braced himself for it, visibly, even. The, I'm worried for you, and all the, I miss us that would inevitably follow, quickly affirmed with the crestfallen, heartbreaking look that only Sakura could achieve so unnervingly beautifully. Instead, it was even worse. I believe in you. If only she hadn't smiled at all that way, the overwhelming tide of grief wouldn't have knocked him over and sent him spiraling down into his own wrenching self-hate. Because, beneath all those smiles and all those jokes, he'd managed to come to an awareness that had only lingered in the undercurrent of his subconscious. A realization he'd been heading towards, but had attempted to delay. That. He was the first to leave turning his face into the glowing sun, into the world doused in gold. She turned away as well, into Kanaha, creased in shadows. He didn't even want to be here. The hill was so steep that Jiraiya could have posed as a bumbling old hermit, squatting at the top to catch a glimpse of a glorious sunrise. The old man had already courteously drawn it out himself, and Naruto immediately recognized the design they'd come up with together. The blonde felt a bit of pride knowing that he'd made most of it Jiraiya had only egged him on a bit, advising but generally leaving creation up to Naruto. And while it had its flaws, the surge of chakra being one of the more irritable nuances, Naruto was still proud of what he'd come up with. How far he'd come. Jiraiya was waiting patiently by the seal, legs crossed and arms folded, face turned into the sun. Yo. The blonde greeted. The toad sun in nodded eyes still closed into the warm light. You say goodbye. Yeah. Naruto answered, stiffly. He stepped into the seal, onto the fond patterns he'd painstakingly created. You don't sound too happy. I'm not good with goodbyes. The blonde shrugged. No guilt. He scowled. How did Jiraiya always know? What for? The Jounin retorted, angrily beginning the hand seals. What did Jiraiya know, anyway? He wasn't the one standing on this paper, unknowingly poised between two roads he couldn't follow. Wasn't stuck with this forlorn longing that Naruto knew was wrong, yet was too strong for him to stop. And he knew, he knew if Jiraiya made him stop this now, told him this experiment was over and crushed this seal, that he'd do everything in his power to get back there. You're a lucky guy, Naruto. 
Jiraiya appraised Wang Li. The seal erupted in a burst of brilliant blue, before it left nothing but a sky full of monstrous, rolling clouds and an old man on a hill. The sun in looked down at the paper crumbling in on itself, on the design made from black and ink. On the design Naruto had made almost entirely by his own doing such a work of genius for a boy so young. I hope you change the world. It was only on the rarest of occasions that Kushina and Minato were able to meet publicly, however obscured it may seem. Even a deserted tea shop like this had Minato jumpy in on edge, glancing at the doors as if he expected the entirety of Iwagakur to come bearing down on the shoji screen. Stop looking so mad. She leaned back, adjusting herself on her pillow. It makes your face look sour. I don't look sour. Minato retorted, a steady pout forming on his face. It only took one grin from Kushina until he was grinning back. You do. She crooned. Like you've swallowed a soured plum. Kinda like a fish, see. To demonstrate, she pursed her lips and squished her cheeks with her hands. Minato quickly put an end to it, kissing her solidly on the mouth until she giggled into it, laughing and pulling away. Everything about Kushina was beautiful. The fiery red hair and the green blue to her eyes. But most of all that soft smile reserved entirely for him. He fingered the ring in his pocket. He'd been thinking about it all yesterday. How was he supposed to find the perfect time? Plan a date at a fancy restaurant. But it was too crowded everyone would see, and Kushina hated places like that, anyway. In their house? But how plain? With his team, perhaps, but he wasn't even sure if he wanted them to know. He'd been fretting about it all morning as well, happy for the distraction as she dragged him to her favorite tea shop, desolate so early in the morning. But why not now? She loved this place and their goddamn chai tea more than anything else in the world, perhaps even him, just as she loved mornings as the sun began to rise. And how could he not, when she looked so lovely, dazzling him with her beguiling smile sun catching at her hair and sloping down her shoulder like an arch of gold? He cleared his throat. So, Kushina. I. And the both of them jolted up, as a surge of chakra seemed to plow right through him like a burst of killer intent. Minato immediately sprung to his feet, head snapped to the direction of the overwhelming amount of chakra. Like a bomb had just been dropped, ripping through the air and alerting everyone to its presence. What was that? Kushina stood as well, peering out the window. Minato attempted to pull her back, away from the only opening, but she only waved him off. The birds are scared. She noted. But I don't see any smoke. Minato looked out as well. The sky was dotted with dark silhouettes, birds taking to the sky in long circular patterns. But there was no smoke, only the subtle blue of the sky and the line of trees. Kushina turned to him, eyes wide and excited. Let's investigate. What, dash? He snorted, incredulously. That's Riddick hey. Hold on. But Kushina was already half out the door, taking flight with the birds, when singing in her hair. He stumbled after her, steadying his footing before leaping into the trees after her. They crossed through the sky, and he eyed the horizon. There was a curious lack of other nin they had been pretty far from the village, but not terribly. The shockwave seemed to have literally ripped through him, but maybe it had been small enough not to alert the presence of the entire village. Naruto had just dropped out of his own seal, falling to the ground unpleasantly and groaning at the headache he was now sporting. Typical of this stupid seal and its stupid imprecision, was it possible he'd used too much chukra this time? He wasn't sure. Quickly, the blonde pocketed the anchor seal on the ground, rolling it into a scroll and shoving it onto one of the containers in his belt just in time, too, as two nin came bolting out of the thick canopy of trees. He wasn't nearly as surprised with Minato as he was with the blonde's red-headed companion. He'd expected some nin to come around, even though the departure was certainly more strenuous than the arrival, the amount of chakra used to do so would at least alert someone. But Naruto's eyes caught with the woman descending from the trees, and his mind short-circuited. The amount of familiarity in Kushina's face was startling. Not nearly as much as Minato, but equally there, subtler around the eyes and in the curve of her chin, the bow of her mouth. The wind picked at her long, fiery hair, just as her eyes trained onto Naruto. There was a brief moment in which she said nothing at all, 
too shocked at how much the boy resembled Minato to do much else aside from stare in silent appraisal. His skin was tanner, yes, lending him a more golden shade, and though his face only vaguely resembled the other man's, just the nose and the brows, perhaps, but everything else seemed just as familiar, though she couldn't place from where, it was the eyes that really caught at her. Those were Minato's eyes. On someone else. Naruto. Minato called out, looking surprised and relieved at the same time. Kushina blinked in confusion, as Minato hedged closer to the younger boy Minato never voluntarily let someone invade his personal space, aside from her and perhaps Jiraiya. He was looking the boy over avidly, checking for wounds. Are you alright? The lemon-haired boy grinned sheepishly. I'm fine. He insisted. I just put too much into that last attack. Put too much? Kushina thought, bewildered. That was a lot of chakra. More than the average ninja would have. Put too much, dash. Minato voiced her thoughts aloud. You could have blown up something with that could have blown up yourself. You think? Naruto pondered curiously, looking entertained at the thought. Inwardly, he was mentally going through possible places far enough not to alert nearby Nin of the seal's use. But how far? The middle of Kumo far? The boy's eyes slid to his mother's, not unsurprised to find her looking at him as well. Oh. Minato looked between the two. I haven't introduced you two yet. The boy peered curiously at her, but with a certain impassivity she didn't think she was supposed to catch. She tried to shake off the strange, unexplainable feeling of familiarity at his face, at the way his face split open with a grin. I'm Kushina. She spoke first, voice strong, just like he'd imagined it to be. Hi. He shook himself out of his daze. I'm Naruto. His mother's voice it was almost calling back to him. Like he was remembering it from a half-remembered dream, long washed in a sea of memories. Minato eased the unsure tension out of the trio easily enough. Cool. Hey, let's go meet my team already, huh? Obito's been looking for you, Naruto. The other blonde perked up, happily confused. Me. Yeah, he's been dying to pick your brain for jutsu. Minato nodded. Thinks you're some sort of Uzushiagaku or warrior god or something. Uzushiagaku. Kushina interrupted, immediately. You're from Uzushiagaku? No. Naruto was quick to protest. No. It's just, well my mom's from there, well she's kind of from there. But my dad isn't, uh, from any ninja clan, I don't think, so I usually just say I'm from Uzushiagaku. Huh. Kushina appraised. You wouldn't happen to have known her clan name, would you? Uzumaki. Naruto's mind supplied bitterly. Why yes, I would. No. He answered, aloud. I didn't really know much about her. The woman's stern eyes softened. Oh, I see. Then she extended her hand. At first, Naruto thought she was trying to shake his hand, but then he caught sight of the tattoo on the back of her hand. The spiral. The sign of Uzushiagaku. I'm from Uzushi. It's been a long time since I've met anyone else from there. I've never been. He answered, honestly. By the time I was born. I don't know. It just never came up in any of my travels. Travels. Kushina echoed, suddenly perking up. Do you travel? I do. He answered, honestly. Much farther than you'll ever know. Naruto wasn't sure how to handle the curious expression on her face. And you. Oi. You guys. Naruto could have sighed in relief, as Kushina's eyes tore away from his own to make out Obito and Rin amidst a sea of shifting people. They'd somehow walked out into one of the main roads, full of Kanaha at its highest peak of shopping. Rin and Obito trekked their way over, Rin coming to a full halt in front of Minato, the older blonde looking confused at her sly face until she opened her mouth. Good morning, Hokage-sama. Minato was quick to slap a hand over his wiggling Jenin's mouth. Not so loud. He hissed, looking around. No one seemed to have heard her. Twenty years in the future and had Minato walked down the street, there wouldn't be a single person who wouldn't have stopped to stare. Perhaps it was just a posthumous reputation, however, 
for no one seemed particularly interested in the Jounin with a blonde mop of hair. Calm down. Kushina rolled her eyes. You're not that famous. And with special relish to Minato's relieved expression, she added, yet. I can't wait for the coronation. Rin squealed, before ribbing Obito. We get front row seats, right, right. Of course. Minato rubbed at his head, grinning. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Sarutobi-sama still has a few months in him left. Doubt it. Obito snorted. Last I heard he was already planning a vacation to Kiragakur. Minato's eyes widened. No, Dash. Who did you hear that from, Dash? Those Chunin at the guard post. Let's eat. Kushina clapped her hands, cutting in swiftly. That's enough about Hokage stuff for today, huh? The comely woman easily maneuvered Minato plus Rin and Obito down the street, subtly switching the conversation over to lighter waters. Naruto frowned, plodding along next to Rin. How strange. Kushina had almost looked uncomfortable at the thought of Minato becoming Hokage. Did she not want the pressure that would come upon them? Or just didn't want Minato to be Hokage? He found himself observing a deeper level to his parents' relationship than he had first thought. The way Jiraiya spoke of them, they were a happy, light-hearted couple with few problems. Though his mother was known for her spitfire temper, he'd never actually heard any evidence of it. Generally, people spoke of her warmly, or respectfully those who knew her, anyway. And the few who were aware of Minato and Kushina's relationship, and the fact that they had him, were quick to refer to them almost like a fairy tale couple. Though he saw very little of this now. Kushina lead them towards her favorite tempura restaurant, a few blocks away. Naruto couldn't help but notice how every time Minato seemed to get closer to her, she'd delicately move away. He frowned. Oh wait. Kushina pouted. The hostess only gave them a slightly empathetic glance. I'm sorry. She shrugged. But it is lunchtime. A party of five? It'll be around twenty minutes. I'll be sure to call you over when your table is ready. Kushina huffed, turning away from the stands and the busy Tempura house, looking almost overcrowded with the amount of people. Rin had somehow roped both Obito and Minato into crossing the street with her, to where an enormous bookstore sprawled over the majority of the corner, leaving Kushina and Naruto to wait for their table alone. He eyed the woman from the side, unsure of what to say. Everything he knew of his mother seemed to have been judiciously turned right side up, and now he was struggling to sift through all the debris, trying to pick at the only truths he had left. Do you like him? Sadly, he hadn't inherited Minato's tactful conversational cues. Ha. Huh. And some say he favored his mother in that regard. Excuse me. The woman turned around in a flurry of burning red hair, looking mildly offended. Minato, I mean. He nudged his head to where the other blonde appeared. It's just, you seem to be avoiding him. What are you, tactical intelligence? Kushina snorted. It's in a shinobi's best interest to understand behaviors. Naruto answered, neutrally. Kushina seemed to appraise him, as if judging his character through her gray, sky-like eyes. For a while, Naruto let her, keeping his face decidedly impassive, letting her peruse what she liked. Of course I like him. She answered with a sigh that seemed to deflate her entirely. That's not the problem. Then what? Naruto titled his head. His reputation? That he'll be the Yondai Masun? That he's infamous and will someday be? All of the above. Kushina cut in, exasperated. She threw her hands up. Naruto was caught in her vibrance. But it's more than that. She looked away. It's me, really. I'm just I don't know. I'm me. And Minato is Minato. There's a lot of difference right there. That doesn't have to mean anything if you don't want it to. Naruto pointed out quietly. It doesn't matter what I think. Kushina sniffed, crossing her arms. She looked a lot like him at that moment, arms folded against her chest and face tilted away. So stubborn and mulish the opposite of Minato, easygoing, and eager to please. He just doesn't see it like I do. I don't think he cares, which is good, in a way. He doesn't worry about what other people think, 
what they will think when he becomes Hokage. I mean, he's going to be the Yondai Me. She croaked out. And I'm a Jin. Naruto was surprised she would even confide in him with something of that magnitude, and she looked surprised herself. Luckily, perhaps for both of them, they were interrupted by a sweet, feminine voice. Kushina-chan. Kushina's face immediately lit up, focusing on someone behind Naruto. The blonde turned around. Only to see Sasuke running towards him. Oh wait. Sasuke wasn't a petite woman. Mikato Uchiha came to a halt in front of her best friend, giving her an ecstatic hug that pulled the taller woman straight off her feet. Kushina squawked, wriggling in her best friend's arms until the smaller Kunoichi put her down. Naruto was trying not to faint. He may have met Mikato or Fugaku and somewhere in the recesses of his mind were two Uchiha with vague, swimming pale faces and dark eyes. Mikato came into view with disturbing clarity, her cute, small nose and big black eyes. Sasuke is cute, small nose and big black eyes. Ew. Sasuke looked so much like his mother that Naruto just decided that, to keep the two very, very far apart in his mind he just wouldn't look at her. What are you doing here? Mikato asked, with a bright, happy smile. God, I haven't seen you in months. Where the hell have you been, Dash? Around. Kushina answered with a sly smile. And I'm waiting in this goddamn line for my tempura. This is crazy, you know? I remember when this place was empty all the time. And we'd come to study for our academy exams. Mikato finished with a giggle. It's really been that long, huh? It's ridiculous. Kushina agreed, before remembering Naruto. Naruto? She barked. This is Mikato. Praise the ground she walks on. Naruto gave an embellished bow, making Mikato stifle laughter. How do you do, Mikato-sama? Don't listen to her, Mikato waved him off with a playful smile. I'm no lady. Not yet, anyway. Kushina crowed. Where is that fool Fugaku, anyway? On a mission. Mikato chirrupied. He's going to be gone until tonight, so I was thinking of picking up some tempura. You should join us, Dash. Kushina interrupted with glee. I'm having lunch here with Minato-san. Minato-san, dash. And his team. The Hokage, huh? Mikato's voice turned sly, and Naruto was suddenly struck by the fact that no, this woman who seemed to clearly know Kushina well hadn't any idea that the two of them were dating. Oh, Kushina-chan. It's not like that. Kushina was quick to hurry out. I'm just good friends with little Rin-chan, you know. Naruto could only scowl. What a load of bull. Man, no wonder no one ever connected him with the fourth, despite the fact that they may as well have been identical twins. Clearly, no one knew the fourth even had the ability, or the chance to procreate. The meek hostess came out after that, ushering them in with a graceful little bow, which Kushina easily plowed right over. She then began to imperiously demand another seat for Mikato, who only half-heartedly attempted to reassure the staff that no, Kushina wasn't going to sue them and bring the entire restaurant down, she just wanted another seat. It was a little hard to tell the difference, though. By the time they'd fully settled, Kushina sandwiched between Naruto and Mikato, Minato, and his team had come back, Rin with more books than it looked like she could carry. Rin was first to delve straight into a conversation about literature, and no one but Naruto seemed to catch Minato's dismayed look at seeing Kushina without an empty chair. Naruto moved around uncomfortable, unsure of whether he should give Minato his seat or stay where he was. But Kushina's hand clamped around his knee like a steel grip, and he stayed where he was. Lunch, from another perspective other than his own, was a light-hearted affair full of churupi anecdotes and a few humorous jokes, like old friends catching up after a long time. But all Naruto could do was toy with his chopsticks, wondering about how little he knew, how much was really left to gather dust in history. Naruto wasn't entirely sure how he managed to walk Mikato home, but the two were going in the same direction, and Naruto supposed he may as well be courteous enough to walk with her even though he was still having issues at looking straight at her face. You really don't have to. Insisted Mikato kindly, as everyone parted their separate ways. Minato and his team to visit Kakashi in the hospital and Kushina to well, Naruto wasn't entirely sure. 
She'd left in a bit of a hurry. Nah, I'm going this way, anyway. And then, with a grin. I'm sure that Fugaku-san wouldn't want you walking home alone, anyway. That Fugaku-san conveniently forgets I'm a kunoichi, and can take care of myself. Mikato snorted, before brightening. But it is very nice of you. Thank you, Naruto-san. It really isn't a problem, Mikato-san. Mikato blinked at the formality, even though she'd used it herself. It's just Mikato. She smiled. Then it's just Naruto. He smiled back. Oh god. He wasn't flirting with Sasuke's mom, was he? Of course not. He mentally slapped himself in the face. That's disturbing. To think this light-hearted woman birthed the two most notoriously stoic Uchiha in history one of which who even destroyed his own clan. So, how do you know Kushina-chan? I don't. I'm friends with Minato, though, and we just happened to meet up, and you know how Rin-chan is with. I wonder who came up with that. Mikato snorted, interrupting him. Those two are so transparent. They might be fooling everyone else, but they're definitely not fooling me. You know. Naruto cut off, incredulously. About, uh, Minato and Kushina. Of course I know. Mikato huffed. I knew since that day Minato rescued her from those Kyumonin. I was under the impression it wasn't common news around here. Oh, it's most certainly not. Think of what would happen if people found out if Iwa found out. Kushin is already in a delicate position, being from Uzushi and all, and that makes it even more difficult to be with Minato. Let alone the fact that she's a... Mikato trailed off, meeting Naruto's eyes before looking away. Ajin Hiroki? Naruto offered. So you knew that too? Mikato whispered, looking a tad surprised. He shrugged. I've met a few. I'm pretty good with chakra identification, so it's easy to tell them apart. The Uchiha took this in stride, nodding. They'll have a lot of problems, I'm sure. But I really just want them to be happy. They will be. Naruto answered with brimming honesty. Even now, I think they're happy. Confused, and a little unsure, but definitely happy. You think so? Mikato gave him a curious tilt of her head. I know so. He affirmed. He found himself at the end of a deep, grey gaze, one he'd seen before. Such conviction. She murmured. Are you looking out for them? They came to a pause at the gates to the Uchiha compound, Naruto not even realizing they'd walked so far. I. Naruto blinked, unsure. I guess so. He ended, lamely. I want to see them happy, too. He must have passed some sort of test in her eyes, because the Uchiha gave a nod of affirmation before rummaging in her hair. She came up with a glimmering silver strand, a necklace at the end of it. Here, I want you to have this. It was a double swirl patterned necklace, but colored black and red. Naruto wondered what was up with him and getting jewelry from girls. It's a sign of good luck. Mikato gave him a happy little smile. Generally, they're shaped like Uchiha fans it's a clan thing, but I feel like this suits you more. I can't take this from you. Naruto declined quickly. I mean, if it's yours. It's okay. She waved him off, pulling out another one from underneath her shirt. I have another one. Kushina-chan has one too we can be matching, any. Sure. Naruto said, for lack of response. I'm sure you'll do a good job, looking after them. For a moment, Naruto thought of Sakura, and her unshakable conviction in him. He wondered what about him inspired people to believe in him, even when he didn't believe in himself. We can take turns. Mikato's eyes shifted up over his head, catching something in the sky. Naruto looked up too, to find a hawk circling slowly above them. That must be for you. Mikato noted. Well, I'll be going then. Good luck, Naruto-kun. She gave him a final wave, before heading into the Uchiha compound. Naruto wondered how she could be so sure it was his, she was a ninja too, after all. Though Kunoichi only took off from work when. Naruto blanched. So it seemed he'd inadvertently met Itachi, too. That's it for part 2.
Thank you for watching and see you on the next video.